I'd like to say good morning to everyone and thank you to our hosts and uh, the monastic body of Bhutan for their kind generosity. And uh, thank you all for coming. I'd like to be in, begin by introducing uh, my topics for today. How does this thing work? Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the political context in northern India, institutionalization of Buddhism, Atisha's early education, his journey to Sri Vijaya, Savanadvipa, the Golden Isle, probable locations, studies with Dharmakirti, Selingpa, return to India and Tibet, and Atisha's legacy. Before the time of the Pala dynasty the, and the birth of Atisha, northern India was largely governed by a dynasty known as the Guptas. The Gupta Empire was at its height in the 4th to 6th century and is considered by many to be a golden age in Indian history. Although the Guptas were predominantly Hindus, they supported other faiths such as Jainism and Buddhism, building the legendary Nalanda University in the 5th century under their royal patronage. The Gupta kings pr uh, promoted science and mathematics, architecture and art. However, by the 6th to 7th century, the empire had fragmented due to constant attacks by the Huns and violent disputes with their neighbors. And although there was some movement from Hinduism to Buddhism at this stage, it was not to last as the traditional leaders were gradually replaced by feudal chieftains who were bent on war and violence in a thirst for power. It was a time when might was right and successful military men gained popularity, but had little interest in traditional religious institutions. Instead, they sought out the advice of ritual adepts who were living on the fringes of society, siddhas, who were said to possess siddhis or psychic powers as a result of their practices. From them, they sought out divinations and rituals designed to destroy their enemies. They took initiations into tantric mandalas, which through which they could attain new divine identities and wield power to achieve their worldly aims. During this period of anarchy, some of the political power vacuum was taken up by the Buddhist Pala kings. Gopala was the first of these, a leader voted to power by other feudal chieftains in the middle 18th, 8th century and who consolidated his lands and position. The Pala kings supported Nalanda once more, and in addition, Gopala built the Buddhist university of Adantapuri. At his death, he handed the large kingdom to his son, Dharmapala, who greatly expanded it with the use of war elephants and made it one of the most powerful empires in northern India. Dharmapala built Vikramshila monastic university and started construction of Somapura, which was finished by his son, Devapala. Pala power was at its height from the 8th to 9th century. However, by the time of Atisha's birth in 982, much territory had once again been lost, as can be seen in the third map here, the reign of Mahipala I. On the other hand, it was to be a final flourish of the Pala empire and a fortunate time to be born for Atisha, as Mahipala I did regain some territories and seems to have been a powerful and very pious king. I mentioned these great Buddhist viharas as they were to play an important role in the life of Atisha. They formed a kind of network of interconnected establishments where professors and students could move easily from position to position and place to place. Such was their fame that they attracted students um, both domestic and international, from as far away as China and Southeast Asia. Here we can see the archaeological sites of Nalanda and Vikramshila as they are today. According to the life of Atisha, he was born to a privileged Pala family in Bihar, and as such started his education early. He's said to have attended Vikramshila and Nalanda, where he studied with eminent teachers of his day. Tantric practices had by now been incorporated into Buddhism, 
And although Tantra may have existed as early as the first century, the vast majority of the Tantric literature was written from the seventh to the 11th century, right in the time of Atisha. So it's small wonder that he left home to become a wandering mendicant for some time himself, and is said to have studied with the black mountain yogi, Rahula Gupta, where he may have been initiated into the He Vajra Mandala. He lived the life of a wandering tantric yogi for several years. But in a sudden turnaround, he decided to become a Buddhist monk and took ordination at Odantapuri Vihara, where he remained to study Buddhist texts and practices. It was while he was at Odantapuri that he heard of the great master um, um, Dharmakirti, who was living and teaching in Suvanadvipa, the Golden Isle. Since Mahayana Buddhism was not as prominent as tant in the tantric atmosphere of India at the time, he resolved to go and study with Dharmakirti to develop the awakened heart of bodhicitta and the mind of enlightenment, both of which Dharmakirti was reput reputed to have accomplished. Before we um, embark on his actual journey, let's look at 10th to 11th century Southeast Asia. What we know of Southeast Asia today was dominated by a maritime empire of loosely affiliated city-states under the control of Sri Vijaya and its capital in Palembang, Sumatra. Their wealth and power lay in the fact that they controlled the east-west trade by taxing ships that passed through the Malacca and Sunda Straits. I'll show you where they are in my next slide. The location of Savanadvipa is mentioned by Arab and Chinese writers and historians, as well as inscriptions which have been found in Sumatra itself and in Nalanda, which refer to Su Sumatra as Savanadvipa and Savanabhumi. So it seems almost certain that it was Sumatra that Atisha went to, to study with Dharmakirti, and the long and arduous 13-month sea voyage would fit into this. So the map on your left shows the sea trade routes between India and Sri Vijaya in Atisha's time. The direction of the merchant ships, such as the one he took to Savanadvipa, would have followed these. Oh, sorry. Did I do a jump? Oh, I did several jumps. Sorry, where are we? <laughs> no, 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 no. Yes. So, sorry, the, the map on your left shows the sea trade routes between India and Sri Vijaya in Atisha's time. The direction of the merchant ships, such as the one he took, would have followed one of these and the timing, you know, the 13-month journey fits with this. The right-hand map shows the Straits of Malacca and the uh, Sunda Straits, uh, which Sri Vijaya controlled, as well as the actual location of, of its capital in Palembang. So um, here we have the Malacca Strait, the Sunda Strait. Palembang is here. And I'd like you to just take note of this area here, which is called Jambi, which I'll come back to later. Um, as I mentioned before, Chinese and Arab records, as well as inscriptions found in Sumatra and Nalanda, point to Sumatra as the location of this legendary Savannah Dweeper, where Atisha is said to have attended a large center of Buddhist learning. But is there any evidence of that in Sumatra? The most obvious place to look first is in Palembang, the capital city of Sri Vijaya and the residence of the royal family, which is located at the mouth of the Musi River. And although some Hindu and Buddhist statues have been found around its banks, no large stone or brick archeological site has yet been discovered. The most significant site in Palembang today, at least from a Buddhist perspective, is the Seguntang Hill, where a large 6th to 7th century Buddha image was found, which you can see here. And another representing the Bodhisattva Vairochana, as well as a small stupa and two inscriptions concerning curses and wars. There are also some Sri Vijayan tombs on the hill, but no evidence of a large center of Buddhist learning. 
Perhaps it may have been lost under the urban sprawl of modern-day Palembang and yet come to light. About 200 kilometers north of Palembang is Jambi, the place I pointed out previously, which is the capital of the Malayu Kingdom, which came under Sri Vijayan control in 692, according to the Chinese histories. Malayu was a very rich kingdom indeed, with an abundance of gold, which came down the Batanghari River from the highlands of Sumatra, as well as ivory, agar wood, and other precious commodities from the interior. Located at the heart of this ancient trade is a very large Buddhist archaeological site called Muaru Jambi. It is dated from the 7th to 13th century and runs along the banks of the Batanghari River for over seven kilometers, covering a full 12 square kilometer in total. Just to get some perspective, Nalanda covers two square kilometers. The site and the main river were interconnected by a complex system of canals, some of which can still be seen today. Here is a, oh, sorry. Oh, gosh, this is such a painless thing. Okay. Here is a map of the site where only eight out of a potential 84 structures have so far been excavated, but seem to consist of a series of shaded platforms and outbuildings resembling study centers more than temples. The site has been poorly excavated and renovated, but it is of great interest as a possible site of Atisha's great center of Buddhist learning. Due to its scale and its architectural similarities to the Viharas of India, but more research will have to be done on this site. It seems that Malayu regained its place as the capital of Srivijaya in around 1025, or shortly thereafter, the year that the South Indian king Rajendra Chola sacked Palembang and Atisha left to return to India. The Tibetan biographies tell us that when Atisha and his followers arrived in Sumatra, they were taken to the Palace of the Silver Parasol, where Dharmakirti taught them the hidden meaning of the Prajnaparamita Suttas, the Abhi Samaya Lankara, in 15 sessions over several days. Under deep discussion among scholars of the day was the nature of emptiness, not only of the individual self as taught in all Buddhist schools, but the nature of ultimate truth of reality itself. The two main schools of thought in the Mahayana were the mind-only school, or Chittamatra, said to have been held by Dharmakirti, and the middle way school said to have been held by Atisha. These are deep and complex philosophies, but we can say that one of the fundamental differences between them is that Chittamantra, or mind-only school of Dharmakirti, posits that all phenomena are merely mental projections, manifesting as objects and habits based on karmic seeds stored in subtle levels of consciousness. Chittamatra denies the true existence of an external reality, but accepts the existence of a mind or consciousness. The middle way school of Atisha posits that all phenomena, including the mind, are empty of independent existence, based as they are on an impersonal flow of causes and conditions or dependent origination. It further posits two truths, the apparent truth and the ultimate truth. The nature of the ultimate truth is that emptiness is the unconditioned nature of things and that even emptiness is empty of existence. In 1025, Atisha returned to Vikram Shila Vihara where he was to become a well-known teacher and eventually its abbot. He wrote and translated many texts including some written by Dharmakirti and due to a revival of Buddhism in Tibet, taught many Tibetan students there. He was eventually invited to Tibet by the king of Gugay, 
to resolve differences between the various schools of Buddhism, and it was there that he wrote his famous text, Lamp for the Path to Enlightenment. This and his many other writings, including the newly translated Jewels of the Middle Way from the collection of the Kadampas, formed the basis of teachings for his Kadampa lineage for years to come. His view was that of the Madhyamaka, his practice the monastic Vinaya, and his instructions mainly bodhicitta. Atisha's legacy. Among important writings are the Bodhisattva's Garland of Jewels, and also I wanted to reconfirm this collection of works of the Kadampas. I don't have the Tibetan name for it, but it's just been translated by the Tibetan and ancient manuscripts department in Dharamsala. It's very interesting. The main Tibetan disciples were Drom, Ku, and Nok, uh, the Dromten Galwe Yungne, his foremost disciple and a lay person, founded the Kadampa lineage and the Retting Monastery. The lineage um, of, of Atisha was Kadam, and later this was taken up by the Gelukpas and is carried by all Tibetan schools. So, in conclusion, the view of emptiness and practices of bodhicitta reduce self-importance, promote compassion, develop contentment, foster empathetic joy, and the aspiration to help all beings. It is the foundation of all Vajrayana practice and remains just as valuable in the modern world, a world in crisis where the view of emptiness and the practice of bodhicitta remain a true garland of jewels. And I'd just like to end by saying, um, quoting a teacher about his teacher, Dhammakirti. I make no distinction among all my spiritual mentors, but because of the kindness of my sublime master from the Golden Isle, I have gained peace of mind and the dedicated heart of the bodhicitta aim. Thank you very much.